Bradley Pierce is an attorney and executive director of Abolish Abortion Texas. And more importantly, he is a husband to his wife, Cindy, a father of their seven children, a member of his local church, and a servant of Christ. And he is also a Baptist. I am an attorney, but I'm first and foremost a Christian. And today I'm going to preach. Tonight I'm going to preach. We've already heard a lot about how important theology is. We're going to talk some more about that. We're going to talk about the theology of civil government, the doctrine of civil government. I say theology of it because civil government begins with the head of civil government, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is Jesus Christ. He is the head of every civil government on earth. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him, as he said in Matthew 28. And all legitimate authority is derived from him. He delegates authority to different spheres of government. Civil government, the church, family, self-government. All legitimate authority comes from him. Jesus told this to Pilate. If you remember when Pilate was questioning Jesus and Jesus didn't answer. Pilate said to Jesus, do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And the ones who are delivering their children over to death have the greater sin. But today we're talking about a bill being carried by those with authority. But we're talking about a bill that we want to be supported by those in authority. And those authorities who refuse to stop the murder of innocent people like Pilate, they also bear sin for what they fail to do with their God-given authority. God institutes civil authority, we see in Scripture in Genesis 9, is when he institutes civil authority on earth. And he does so to deal with a particular crime. He delivers this to Noah, and he says in Genesis 9, verse 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Why? For God made man in his own image. That's why. That's why it's that important. Because before this, when Cain shed the blood of his brother, Abel, God judged him directly. But in Genesis 9, God is now delegating authority to mankind to be his minister of justice. Particularly with this, when it comes to the crime of murder. And God demands justice for human bloodshed, and he delegates authority to civil government to be his earthly minister of justice, as he tells us in Romans 12. And God repeats this command in the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 21, he ascribes a civil penalty to it. In Exodus 21, he also makes it clear, I believe, that it applies to children in the womb. That's where it talks about if two men are striving and a child dies. There is a civil penalty, and it is equal to the killing a born person. You know, God also provides a process for how these things are to be taken care of. Two or three witnesses, as he tells us in Deuteronomy 17. God also applies this prohibition against murder to child sacrifice in Leviticus 20. God really cares about his image in Scripture, whether it be the born or the unborn, whether it be adult or or children, God cares about his image, and he has spoken to it, and scripture is sufficient to tell us how to deal with it legally. And the original and number one role of civil government is precisely to be God's minister of justice for the crime of murder, as we heard in Genesis chapter 9, including murder of the preborn and child sacrifice. And that's not just the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. We see that in Romans 13, how God has given authority to the civil government. And I want to talk more about Romans 13, because I want to talk about 
how God, he has given authority to civil government, and he's given the authority to civil government to do exactly what SB 13 does, exactly what this bill that we're here to rally around does. And it's fitting that it's SB 13, because I believe that Romans 13 directly supports it. So we're going to look at SB 13 through the lens of Romans 13 this evening. And Romans 13 says in verse 1 through 5, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that, have exist, that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. The civil government has legitimate authority delegated to it by God, and when it exercises it lawfully, in accordance with God's law, legitimately, it is the minister of God to you for good. But it's also the minister of God to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And how does it execute that wrath? With a rod? With keys? No, with a sword. With a sword, which is not an instrument of chastening, but it's an instrument of death. And it does not bear that instrument in vain, but to execute. That's what God, that's how much he cares about his image. And that's how much he wants to also deter us from destroying that image. What about SB 13? Some people say SB 13 and Romans 13 conflict. Some people, you may have even heard this at the Capitol from some well-meaning people. They say, well, the Supreme Court's the governing authority. And under Romans 13, we need to obey them. And they say we can't do SB 13. So there you go. Well, I don't think they're reading SB 13 accurately. We are supposed to be governing, uh, subject to the governing authorities. But SB 13, I'm sorry, Romans 13. Boy, I'm going to get confused with that. <laughs> Romans 13, Romans 13 is saying the exact same thing that I am. Who needs to be reading Romans 13? All of us. But who needs to be re reading Romans 13 in this context? It is the Supreme Court. It is the legislators in our land. Because R Romans 13 says to be subject to the governing authorities. Well, in this country, much different than ancient Rome, we the people are the governing authorities. Okay? Stop reading Romans 13 like we're all still serfs and slaves under a dictatorship. By the grace of God, we have liberty in this country, and we have the vote in this country. We hold the power to elect our own civil officials, and we've created a document to serve as our authority over those civil officials. So let them be subject to it. Let them be subject to the governing authority the law of the land, the Constitution. Let them be subject to the governing authorities. That's what we're calling on them to do. For whoever resists it, the governing authorities, Romans 13 tells us, resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And so those, the Supreme Court, those legislators, if you resist the Constitution, then you resist the ordinance of God because it is the governing authority of our country to the extent that it does not conflict, of course, with God's law. And you will bring judgment on yourself when you resist it. Romans 13. Yes, Romans 13. That's the one that says, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying it's the one that says, but if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. 
That's what SB 13 is calling you to do, to not bear it in vain. For you are God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. That's what we're calling on the civil government to do, to do what God tells them to do, to execute his wrath on those who practice evil. Romans 13 is exactly what we're calling our elected officials to obey. So when someone invokes Romans 13, Romans 13, you say, yes, I'm right there with you. Absolutely. Yes. Let our officials be subject to the governing authority of the Constitution. Yes. Let them be a terror to evil. Let them bear the sword and not in vain. Yes, let them be a minister of God, an avenger of wrath, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Yes, let us and our officials obey Romans 13, and that's exactly what SB 13 does. And that's why I'm here to support it, not because of any man or organization, although I'm grateful for all of that, but because I believe that it is consistent with what God requires of us and of our elected officials. And so I support it because I believe I have to support it because I want to be on the same side as God. So not only does SB 13 follow the Constitution, which is the law of the land, it is the governing authority, but it provide, also provides equal protection. You know, God uses the same word to describe children, whether they're in the womb or whether they're outside of the womb, in Scripture. There are many examples of this. You can look at Luke 122, when it's talking about John the Baptist in his mother's womb. And the Greek word there, I'm mispronouncing, I'm sure, brephos. Brephos. And then in Luke 2.12, it says you'll find a babe in a manger, already born, brephos. It's the same word. God uses the same word to describe both, and he treats them the same throughout Scripture. God treats their murder the same, like we talked about in Exodus 21. If you want to hear more about that, then uh, I'd love to talk with you more about that. But I believe they're the same. God treats them the same. They're of equal value because they're equally made, as we've already heard, in his image. And because they're made in his image just as much as any born person, then they must be treated equally. And because they're made in his image just like any born person, they must be protected equally. SB 13, the heart of it, doesn't create new law. SB 13 doesn't create new law. We already have law against murder in this state. There's already a law against murder, but there's an exception to it that says it doesn't apply to people before they're born. All SB 13 does is remove that. And it says that this law that already exists, that already protects every person in this room, every person watching this, that that same law should equally protect those in the womb where all of us once were. And we're no more valuable on the outside than we were on the inside. And we should be as equally protected on the outside as on the inside. SB 13 removes discrimination from the law and provides for equal protection. And SB 13 doesn't single anyone out. Some people say, well, you're just going after the woman. No. SB 13 doesn't single anybody out. SB 13 not only provides to protect everyone equally, it also restricts everyone equally and prohibits everyone equally. And so anyone who willingly participates in an abortion would be equally subject to SB 13. And that doesn't mean that everyone would get the same outcome Right? That's for our justice system to sort out. But our legislature, their job is not to figure out each case on a case-by-case basis. It's not to make law for all these individual cases. Right? That's the role of the justice system. The role of the legislature is to pass laws that apply equally to everyone without discrimination. And that's what SB 13 does. That's what SB 13 does. You know, God's law 
It has, there's precepts, you shall not murder. But then God does have case law where he talks about different um, circumstances and about how the principles apply to different circumstances. And some people may come and, and bring up circumstances here. They say, well, what about a woman who is forced to, to get an abortion? What about her? What about that woman? And there are, that does happen. That does happen. And that woman should not be penalized for murder because she is being forced to do something. But we actually don't have to create new law in order to protect her. Oklahoma Criminal Code, section 155, 156, 152, paragraph 7. Now here's the lawyer in me coming out. Already would protect her. And under SB 13, she would be protected from being found guilty of murder. So SB 13 protects when a woman is a victim. SB 13 would protect her because the same, it would apply those laws to protect her. What about a woman who doesn't know what, she, what she's actually doing? Well, first of all, SB 13, as a law should be a tutor, SB 13 teaches, it teaches what life really is. Not with, with rhetoric, but with actual substantive law. And so there will be a whole lot less ignorance after SB 13 is enacted. But even for those who don't know what they're doing, there's a doctrine called mistake of fact. Someone has to know what they're doing in order to be held guilty of a crime. And that's already in the law. Oklahoma Criminal Code 152, paragraph 5. And SB 13 would protect those as well. What about medical emergencies where a patients have to be triaged, the mother and the child? There's a common law doctrine of necessity in Oklahoma. What about the man? Some people say, well, I'll support this bill. You may have heard this before. I'll support this bill when it applies equally to men. Well, then you need to sign up right now because it does. It applies equally to everyone. Everyone is equally subject to the law. And if any man forces a woman or even helps, aids and abets a woman to get an abortion, he's equally subject to this law. That's the whole point. It's for the law to apply equally to everyone and not to single anybody out. And there's other bills in Oklahoma and around the country that fall short of the biblical standard. Like a, you may have heard of heartbeat bills that says once a baby has a heartbeat around eight weeks, then that's when we should protect them. Well, just, just there's all kind of issues with those, but let me just get to one of them real fast. None of those laws that have been enacted in many states at this point have gone into effect. They have all been struck down by the courts, or the courts have all ruled them to be struck down. What about bills like HB 1182 to take away medical license from doctors who perform abortions? Have you looked at 1182? Have you looked at HB 1182? It says for a doctor who performs an abortion that he, would, he or she would lose their license for one year and receive a fine of $500. Is that justice? I want to talk more about that later. Well, SB 13 would actually take away their medical licenses too. It would too. Because guess what's grounds for taking away someone's medical license? Committing a felony. And that's what it, murder would be under SB 13. So they would definitely lose their license under SB 13 as well. Bradley, what about total bans like we've seen in Oklahoma? Isn't that sort of like SB 13? No, it's not. Because what they pass in Oklahoma, I was going to say Oklahoma, I mean Alabama. What they pass in Alabama, a total ban, they actually put in the language of that, and then the governor put in her signing statement, and then the attorney general, they're all saying, this is a total ban, but we're actually not going to enforce this until the Supreme Court says we can. Wait, then why did you do it? <laughs> why did you, it's not worth the paper it's written on then. 
and it's deceptive. There's a lot of people in Alabama now who think that abortion has been banned. Meanwhile, Planned Parenthood is building a brand new mega abortion mill in Alabama right now. It's not stopping them. SB 13 wouldn't do that. SB 13 wouldn't wait for the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. SB 13 would say, a murder is illegal now. And all those other bills I talked about that have been passed in all those other states, the courts have already ruled them, has already struck them all down. If we pass something like that here, it's just going to be struck down too. And then what are the politicians going to do? They're going to wipe their hands. Hey, we tried. We tried. We passed this and uh, the court struck it down. But we got we to, gotta, I did my part, so give me your vote again. Give me your money. Listen, the law is a tutor. And what should it be teaching? That abortion is health care? No. That abortion is a mere breach of medical ethics? No. No. It should be teaching that abortion is murder, the desecration and destruction of the image of a holy God. That abortion is sin. That's what our law needs to be teaching. Have you ever seen an image of an abortion or a video of an abortion? It's often called a graphic image. Go look at one of those for five minutes and then come back and tell me that taking away a doctor's medical license for one year and finding them $500 is justice for that child. No. And those other bills that we just discussed, they just comply with the evil and unconstitutional decision of Roe versus Wade. SB 13 doesn't do that. SB 13 follows the law, follows the Constitution, follows the governing authority, and ignores those who are ignoring the law. If the courts are ignoring the law, we need to ignore them and follow the law. That's what SB 13 does. We don't need to legitimize Roe versus Wade, which all these other bills do. We need to follow the law. Pastors who are here and listening to this, I want to encourage you. Please shepherd, teach, disciple, feed the people of God. Equip them for the work of ministry for this hour. Please equip them to be messengers of truth, to tell the politicians what they must do, and lead them by setting an example. And please do not do something. Do not do this. Do not do what I have seen some do, what I've seen many do, who instead of being the voice of God and his people to the politicians of what the politicians must do, instead become the voice of the politicians, to go back to their congregations and tell them what compromises they must accept. No, we need to tell them what they must do. I wanna go back to Pilate, talk about Pilate for just a few moments as I close. You know, one of the greatest sins in human history was committed by a magistrate who had the power to stop the murder of an innocent person. You know, Pilate, we consider him one of the greatest villains of history. In the Apostles' Creed, his name is even mentioned. He's one of the greatest villains of history. But what did he do? Actually, he did some good things. He actually did some good things. He said some pretty nice things about Jesus. Remember that? He said some really nice things about Jesus. When others came to try to murder Jesus, Pilate defended Jesus. He said that Jesus is faultless. He said that Jesus was just. He said he's a just man. He said he's innocent. Pilate tried hard to keep Jesus from being murdered. In the face of a mob, Pilate called Jesus a king. And when, they, when he put that in writing and they wanted him to back down from it, he didn't. He stood by what he had said and what he wrote. And after Jesus had been murdered, Pilate guaranteed that the body of Jesus would get a decent burial. That's what Pilate did. 
Why is he a villain then? If he did all those good things, why is he a villain? Because it's what he didn't do. When he had been given authority by God. It's what he didn't do. Like many legislators and governors who do virtually nothing to stop the murder of over 600,000 pre-born children, innocent people in this country, in the U.S. They say a lot of nice things. They say that pre-born children are living from the moment of conception. They say that they're equally valuable. They say they're made in God's image. They say they're innocent and that they're worthy of protection. But what do they do? What do they do? When they have that power, they say nice things, and perhaps they make an effort to look like they're doing something. But what do they do? In fact, saying all those nice things condemns you all the more. When Pilate said, this is an innocent man, he condemned himself even more. When he said that this man is a king, when this man is a just man, he condemned himself all the more because of what he did not do which is stop his murder. So also, our representatives are condemned all the more when they acknowledge the personhood of the victims, when they, give them, when they pass bills to give them a decent burial, but when they do nothing to stop their actual murder. Amen. And Pilate ultimately failed to protect innocent life because he feared Caesar, like our representatives refused to do so because of the Supreme Court. There is one more similarity and two more differences between Pilate and those legislatures who refuse to provide and establish justice. The similarity is that as Jesus said to Pilate, the greater sin is on those with murderous intent in their hearts. Right? Pilate did not want to murder Jesus. There are many legislators who do not want babies to be murdered. They do not want that. I'm not saying that they do. They want to stop it, like Pilate wanted to stop the murder of Jesus. However, although greater sin is on those who commit the act of abortion, there is still sin on those who, like Pilate, have authority from God for such a time as this and refused to use it to perform the most basic function of civil government that God has established, protecting innocent life. There's two differences, though, between those kind of legislators and Pilate. First is that Pilate really was under the authority of Caesar. He, no doubt he had even sworn an oath of allegiance to Caesar. Caesar really was over him. But for, for these legislators, there is no authority over them except the state and U.S. constitutions to which they've sworn an oath. There are no institutions and authority over them like that. The Supreme Court is not over them. They do not swear an oath to the Supreme Court. They swear an oath to the constitutions of this state and of the United States. And those constitutions require them to provide equal protection to every person living within their jurisdiction. The second difference between Pilate and legislators like that are that Caesar really was the boss of Pilate. Caesar hired him and he could fire him. The Supreme Court is not the boss of the senators and representatives of this state. We are. The people are. But that also means that a measure of the guilt is on us. When we hire them and they fail in their duty and we rehire them, that blood is on our hands. And that's why it's so important that we not only stand up for bills during this legislative session, but that for those who fail to do their duty come election season, we have a duty there too. We have a duty to fire them or else the blood is on our hands too. A measure of that guilt is on us. You know, Pilate, when he finished, he washed his hands. 
Wash his hands. This, this innocent man's blood is not on my hands. That's a gesture that he performed. It no more washed the blood off his hands. He couldn't do that. Well, we perform gestures. Politicians perform gestures, like passing heartbeat bills that they know are just going to get struck down, like passing Born Alive Infant Protection Acts that do virtually nothing, like passing bills like HB 1182 to revoke medical licenses, which is also going to get struck down. Because guess what? The Supreme Court has said you cannot create an undue burden on a woman to get an abortion. Well, if you have to be a doctor to perform an abortion, and you say all doctors who perform abortions are going to lose their license, you've just created a pretty gigantic undue burden, undue in their eyes, burden upon a woman to get an abortion. That's going to get struck down. It's never going to go into effect. It's a waste of time. Except in one respect. It lets them wash their hands. It's a gesture. Where they can say, hey, we tried. Just like Pilate said, I tried. I tried. God is just. And our sin, which calls out for eternal justice, but Christ on the cross paid for that. But there's bloodshed committed in our midst, which also cries out for justice. And it will come. But let's also remember that God is merciful. And there would have been forgiveness for Pilate. There would have been forgiveness for Pilate if he had come in repentance. There was repentance for Paul. Paul, Paul didn't say, this blood's not on my hand. He willingly participated in and encouraged and supported the killing of Christians, of the killing of Christ. Because what did Christ say? Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And yet there was forgiveness for Paul, and there will be forgiveness for every legislator who comes to Christ in repentance for what they have done in the past and not doing their duty. But there has to be fruit of repentance, and the fruit of repentance is that you do your duty. The fruit of repentance is SB 13. It's supporting a godly, righteous bill. That is fruit of repentance. Yeah. And to the legislators and leaders, history will look back on us. And all the good things you say, and all the good things you did like Pilate, will not be remembered. Instead, history is going to look back upon you with disdain because of what you did not do if you fail to support Righteous legislation. Put aside history for the moment. Who cares what future generations think of us whenever God right now is looking at you? God is looking at you right now. And what will he do when you are in office and you have authority by him? He's put you there for such a time as this. What will your refusal to look, look like to him right now? And so I would call on everyone, every pastor, to support this bill, SB 13. It's a biblical, righteous bill. And I would call on every legislator who fears God to support this bill. And even for those who don't fear God, the, like the unrighteous judge in Scripture, we're going to keep coming. We're going to keep coming, and we're going to be the persistent, like the persistent widow. And we're going to keep coming until they say, okay, I'll give justice to the preborn. Amen.